Hi everybody, welcome to Calibrating Aircraft and Truck Scale Short Course. My name is Henry Zumbrun. I'm the president of Morehouse Instrument Company. Here is my contact information. I wanted to show, before we begin this, I wanted to show everybody our technical papers that are available on our website, mhforce.com press. We have technical papers and we have blogs. We have about 80 blogs, all to help you improve measurement. About two are about Morehouse. The rest of them are about things that you can do to improve your measurement, something we're very passionate about. And we also have these technical papers here that are, you go to press and, and technical papers. Lots of different technical papers. Today we're talking about aircraft scales in which we wrote a technical paper called Aircraft Scale Calibration and Measurement Capability Using a Morehouse 804000 Press. If you're trying to calculate your calibration and measurement capability for your scope, uh, the CMC uncertainty parameter, this is a really, really good paper and resource. It was written back in 2016 and it's just a really good resource to help you do that and we took a scale a resolution of the scale. We did lots of testing, lots of different things with adapters. So just wanted to make everybody aware of that additional resource. With that being said, I am passionate about the measurements we, we make, so much so that our company's purpose is, is simply this. We create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements and for today, Mass, mass measurements. We have an app. This app is available on Android and th this app is also coming out soon for Apple devices. Uh, should be out by May, uh, May, June time frame of this year, which is 2020. I have a question for everybody. Before we start, uh, this is a short course, but I'd really like to start talking about what equipment is currently being used by your company to calibrate aircraft or truck scales, and what are the current challenges to calibrate this equipment? Would you know of them? I'm gonna go over some of those and hopefully some helpful tips. Here, understand things. We have this machine, it's a Morehouse USC 60K with reference load cell and Morehouse 4215 indicator. Uh, this new system was redesigned to be more rigid than our previous system. The best four systems are plumb level square rigid and have very low or no torsion so th those are things to keep in mind knowing those those parameters we want to we want to meet with any force machine we designed this machine to be a lot more rigid than the older one so there's less bending the cross head bent a little bit this one does not this picture shows an adapter that was designed to better replicate a tire. The purpose of calibration is usually to replicate how the instruments are being used. Now, with truck scales, you're not always going to do that because they, they use them on non-flat surfaces. They use them on concrete, may not be leveled. The tires are going to be, you know, different tire pressures. However, what we can do in our labs, the best jobs we can do, we can have a flat surface. This, uh, this machine obviously has a flat surface. And we can use an adapter that best replicates the tire. You know, we make several of uh, these adapters with, to different specification that best simulate the actual tire. We've had customers buy these. They've done their own test on scales. Really, really cool thing if you're, if you're making that critical measurement and you want to know how good that scale is, you can use different adapters in a really rigid press and you can test it. So I have questions. Uh, we start, which setup best replicates how the scale is being used? We have this one, which is A. You know, here's here's that adapter, that rubber adapter that kind of simulates the tire, gives it gives it a pretty pretty substantial footprint. Or we have this one, which placing multiple weights on the scale, just stack weights. Obviously, here A. You can see here the tire footprint. We have the rubber. We're going to generate our force. We could also we're using the scale. We can also generate mass. We have a free program online that that can take your gravity and convert our force values back to mass values if you want to calibrate them in mass. It's very important though if you calibrate in mass that you take into account the your local gravity and that you do them in or very very close to the location which they are being used. If you're calibrating them at your facility in Pennsylvania and shipping them to say Alaska, we know the difference in gravity is about 0.2 percent. Is that good enough or not? On a 1 percent scale, you know, you're going to start eating up about 20 percent of the air and it, you could get out of tolerance conditions when it's actually intolerant. So very, very important to get the force to mass correct. Here, 
Uh, we're fortunate enough, enough, we've received a bunch of truck scales to test. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, I have a large quantity of cells, and now I can go get various data points. I can take all these cells, we can swap, we can take the different size tires, we can swap them on all scales. Instead of just one instrument, we can test a whole lot. This lot performed pretty well. So, you know, showing you guys this, uh, guys and gals, this, this picture showing two different size adapters. Uh, will there be a difference in the measured values? Say, look, I have a large adapter, big tire, maybe, you know, and I have a small adapter, maybe just a single tire. You know, just think about it. What are, what are your thoughts? Well, there is a difference. Um, the calibration of the truck scale on our machine, the test comparing the differences in the footprint uh, on different tires on the scale. Here's, here's I comb through all the data, and typically here's what we're finding. Instrument reading normal pad uh, and instrument reading small pad. The specification of this, the tolerance is 1% of applied, and the t tolerance uh, percentage by using different pads. If we're changing that footprint of the tire in here, we're going from a reading of 20,060 pounds to 19,920 pounds. That's a difference of 140. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail down here. Here's where I am. So there's a difference of 140 pounds, which is eating up 0.7% of my overall tolerance, of my 1% tolerance, which is, you know, 200 pounds. So 140, I'm eating up 200, that's a lot. You know, if the scale's on its edge, that could be an in or out of tolerance, that could be recals, it could be a lot. So it's it's not pushing it out of tolerance. We had, didn't find that with this particular scale, but it is eating up the majority of the tolerance. So the best practice is going to be to use that those rubber pads to replicate the tire. Now, I did not do the same test stacking weights, but I can assure you that stacking weights are going to be much, much worse from other tests. So... There, this blown up in more detail. You can see how it creeps out on small for or in small calibration of you know small masses or small forces. Here, uh, this one was in force, so I'm talking force. But there's wasn't much difference until we got to the higher forces, and that's really where it showed itself. And uh, with a one percent uh, tolerance limit to you know, and we're we're showing this to simulate the tire with a one percent tolerance limit using the proper pad to simulate a tire. This is what we're looking at. We're looking at a measured value of you know, twenty thousand and sixty. When we look at this actual graph, what we're seeing, we're seeing a uh, tolerance here. That is this line. The red line is tolerance. We are seeing a guard banded limit, which is basically taking the measurement uncertainty into account. This is, even though I have a tolerance of plus or minus 200, I'm, if I'm not taking my measurement uncertainty into account, or I'm doing simple acceptance, that's my tolerance. But if I'm doing an accredited cal for ISO 17025, I'm going to need to somehow have the conversation with my customer and take the measurement uncertainty into account in some way, shape, or form, unless they sign off on simple uh, acceptance. So if we take that in, into account, that's what's called a guard band. The guard band comes from the radio days, so you wouldn't have stations interfering. You know, you wouldn't have, you know, your FM signals and, and AM signals mixed. So they gave a they gave a space between them, uh, a, a band between the signals. So, you know, you wouldn't be driving down the road and he hearing Willie Nelson and then Led Zeppelin come on. So, you know, be a cool mix, but uh, just one of the things that they did. So when we talk guard band, it's it's a it's a buffer or a limit to ensure that we're in compliance. Here we have the nominal value, the green line. This is what we want to hit. This is our twenty thousand pounds of force, and then we have our measured value. Uh, this is the the brownish value that's that's over here. Um, this uh, with my highlighter. Uh, this value is over here, and then we have the 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 width of this is our really our uncertainty. Um, the width of this curve is is really our um, uncertainty. So, and the repeatability of the device and everything else. So, looking at all of this, we have you know measured value, nominal value, guard band limit, and tolerance. We look at this in more detail. 
So I have a nominal value of 20,000, and I have specification limits, clearly defined, plus or minus you know, 200 pounds. I have a measured value of 20,060. Measurement error, that's my difference between my nominal value and what I'm actually observing. And we can, gra we can show this graphically. In this case, um, this scenario here that I'm showing, um, we have uh, larger uncertainty, and that larger uncertainty is pushing the risk. So looking at the same graph, we're looking at the same graph, and then we're adding the additional 0.7% error between switching adapters. That's what's important here. You know, remember that was real small. The, uh, the, the expanded uncertainty was real small in that other graph. And now we're adding that difference saying, hey, maybe I'm changing adapters. Maybe I'm not replicating the tire on, on this one. Uh, maybe I'm using a small and then a large tire is going to pull up on the scale. So what this is showing us is that it's putting us outside of the risk that we would like to see. We would like to see less than 2% risk for many calibrations. So we add this, uh, what, what essentially happens if we're not using proper adapters and switching them, what essentially happens here is we have to be in a guard band a limit. We have to have a reading on our scale to have 2% or less. This is uh, right here on, right here to have 2% or less, we have to have a measured value between 19,955.168 and 20,044.832. We measured 20,060. So if I add the additional error, if I don't have a good process, I don't replicate the adapter that best replicates the tire, chances are I'm not gonna meet the 2% 2, 2 or less risk. Uh, that's what we're showing based on the data that was gathered for this. This area, when, I, when we say a 3.19%, that is that area, that is the area to the right of our specification limit. Here's our upper specification limit. This is hanging over. So we have 3.19% of the curve is above the upper specification limit, not good. We've tested this on different ones. That one was an actually fairly good truck scale. Uh, not all are the same. Some are very, very drastic. Here's, uh, here's one where we tested up to 40,000 pounds. You can see the results uh, with a small pad, large pad, large pad. Look, hey, a large pad is relatively what we think is, is what people should be doing here. And if you look at the large pad at 40,000, the reading reads 40,010. That's great. That's, that's very little bias on that. But if we look at the difference here, specifically at 36,000 to um, small versus large pad, we have 470 pounds difference, pounds of force difference. That's a 1.306% error. That's much greater than the tolerance of the scale. So some have large differences, some have differences that may be within tolerance per the previous example, and some repeat very well under different loading conditions. This, is, this scale is one that you must use the larger pad to get in tolerance. If you don't use it, if you put something small on it and then try to weigh that, it's not going to give you the, ac the accurate results or the results that you're expecting. So truck and aircraft scales are typically used to weigh trucks and airplanes with tires sitting on several scales. Um, any adapter used during calibration should be composed of the same type of rubber and should have the same footprint as the tire to ensure accurate results. As I said, you know, aircraft, you're weighing an aircraft, you're probably looking at three or more scales. You know, if, if, you're not, if you're not replicating that tire, your center of gravity could be off and that could be problematic. And then we're, we start looking at other things like, uh, you know, large versus small expanded uncertainty. And what we want as part of our process, we want to have that small relative expanded uncertainty, which gives us a much bigger window to, you know, make a statement of compliance. Whereas if we, as a lab, have large uncertainties, we can, we'll have a lot less of an acceptance interval. So... Other things to consider, the lab that performs the calibration, in all, in best case scenarios, you want to go to the lab with the lowest uncertainties. And the ones that you can trust, not ones that have on their scope that say, hey, we have an accuracy of 0.1% of, of applied from 1,000 pounds to 100,000 pounds. That's not believable. Uh, in, in a lot of scenarios, that's just not 
not believable. So you really have to know what you're doing as far as the CMC. As I showed people earlier, that CMC uncertainty parameter, go read the paper if you're if you're more interested or have more interest in how to how to set up a budget for uh, aircraft scale. Additional error surface, additional error sources that we've seen, uh, not converting force to mass, uh, mass calibration at one location and then shipped to another location. As I mentioned earlier, PA to or, uh, PA to Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. We know the error. I know that error. Uh, in, the difference in gravities is about uh, 0.185 percent. Timing profiles, uh, alignment from uneven concrete. Manufacturers of these devices say they need to be very, very uh, flat for calibration, but then in use, they're not so much flat. They're usually used on some kind of uneven concrete and the technicians typically don't take care of them because they are very heavy, at least some of them are. So when we look at converting force to mass, and this is something we need, need all need to be aware of, there is a difference. Uh, here the Here's an exercise really where we're looking at converting Force is um, the equation for forces here, where M is the mass of the weight, G is the gravity at a fixed location, D is air density, and uh, big D is material density. Conventional mass of the artifact, the conventional mass is defined as the mass of material of a specified density that would exactly balance the unknown object if the weighing were carried out at a temperature of 20 degrees C with an air density of 0.0012%. I have lots of blog posts on this. Uh, here's here's the example. You know what we would typically do: we'd obtain the measured force value, we would find the gravity at the location of the measurement. This can be done by NOAA. Uh, we would find the air density, material density, or use conventional mass formula for Denver. If we're looking at Denver at around 24 degrees, air density may be estimated, and material density may be estimated at X. If we if we use these numbers, we really should have the material density you know, determined for, for our weights. Hopefully the people that, you know, have, have provided the weights or that, that you purchase the weight from can provide that density if you want to make the mass to force or the force to mass. Uh, and you can use the following formula, mass equals force times, you know, there's gravity divided by the local gravity times 1D minus D. If we do this, a force of 10,000 pounds on a scale and we ship that scale to Denver and they want to convert it to mass becomes a mass of 10,011.89 pounds. Lots of things here to do. We simplified this whole process by providing an app. It's the Morehouse Local Gravity app. It will convert pounds force to mass. It will convert mass. It will also convert mass to force. So here's some screenshots. Again, this is available on Google Play Store right now, and it is coming, depending on when you are watching this, it should be here may, sometime May of 2020 or June of 2020. So don't worry, we have an app for it, we can simplify it, as long as you can see, as long as the GPS works, this will work. It will not work in an underground bunker, it will not work underground, you need to have a signal where you the cell phone can get your coordinates. So it takes the coordinates of your cell phone, goes to NOAA, finds the, altitude, finds the latitude, longitude, and attitude altitude does the calculation and converts everything so it also does it also acts as a if as a conversion too if you want to convert newtons to pounds kilonewtons grams for steins metric tons all of those mega newtons so really uh something that is free to download and something we're proud of so competence and measurement error some additional things you may want to consider is always using proper adapters in this case it was the rubber uh, the footprint replicating the tire improper adapters can produce errors 10 to 20 times that of manufacturer's stated accuracy proper alignment uh, adapters and proper methods for loading threads misalignment different hardness adapters and thread loading versus shoulder loading contributed to decrease in the repeatability of the measurement results resulting in additional measurement error and then reproducibility and uh, repeatability and reproducibility tests as well as proficiency tests are all good methods for detecting errors again I showed you where our technical papers were their MH force there you know you go to press you can pull all our technical papers. And it is April of 2020, and we are going through COVID-19. So I wanted just to end this with, you know, tell everybody that I care about you. 
every single person that watches this, if you're a customer of ours or not, stay safe and stay positive. The best thing you can do during these times of crisis is just, you know, have a good level head. It's hard to do when you're not used, and we as humans are not used to being cooped up inside. Very hard to do. Just try to stay safe, pay, stay positive. If you, if you really want to work on something, you can start working on your uncertainty budgets, which we have a lot of information for that. So thank you. Thank you for your time. It is valuable. Thank you for listening to me. Take care.